He was a junior hockey superstar and the number one selection in the NHL draft. But his NHL dream quickly became a nightmare and he never reached the heights expected of him. However, his impact on the world and the NHL had little to do with unfulfilled expectations. Instead, the story of Doug Wickenheiser is a story of a proud and courageous man whose resilience in the face of public failure and grace amidst heartbreaking misfortune left a proud legacy that continues long after his tragic death. Over to Hunter who shoots block, Wickenheiser scores! Doug Wickenheiser, the Blues pull it off and it's unbelievable! Doug Wickenheiser was born on March 30, 1961 in Regina, Saskatchewan. He was a stellar youth athlete, excelling as both a left-handed pitcher in baseball and a dominating scorer in hockey. By the time he was 14, his games were attended by numerous NHL scouts. At age 16, he joined the proud Regina Pats franchise and would become a premier player in the Western Canadian Hockey League. Wickenheiser had it all, size, skill, skating ability, and a high-level hockey IQ. After his second junior season, he was offered an $80,000 year contract by the WHA Birmingham Bulls, but Doug rejected that to remain in juniors and stay focused on his NHL dream. During the 1979-80 season, Doug dominated the junior ranks, leading the WHL in goals with 89 and points with 170. In the postseason, he captained coach Brian Murray's squad to the WHL championship while leading the league in playoff assists and playoff points. At the conclusion of the season, more accolades piled in for Doug. In addition to being named the top player in Canadian junior hockey, Doug was also awarded the WHL MVP. It was named to the WHL first all-star team. Recently eliminated in round one of the 1980 playoffs and one season removed from their fourth straight Stanley Cup, the Montreal Canadiens were a franchise in transition. After the 1979 season, legendary GM Sam Pollock retired, coach Scotty Bowman left for the Buffalo Sabres, and future Hall of Famers Jacques Lemaire, Yvonne Cornoyer, and Ken Dryden all retired. By 1980, Irv Grunman was named Team GM, Ron Caron was Director of Player Personnel, and Claude Ruel was now Head Coach. And there was plenty of reason to believe the Canadians' decline would be brief. The brilliant Pollock had a propensity to compile first-round draft picks, often at the expense of the league's lower-tier teams. In this fleecing, Pollock sent two minor leaguers, Ron Andruff and Sean Shanahan, along with the 19th overall pick in the 77 draft, to the lowly Colorado Rockies on September 76 for the first round pick of the Rockies in 1980. Now it didn't seem like a bad deal for the fledgling Rockies at the time as they thought that surely by 1980 the club would be nowhere near the bottom of the standings. As it turned out however Don Cherry's 1979 80s Rockies team finished dead last among the NHL's 21 teams. Thus the Canadians had secured the number one overall pick and they chose Wickenheiser. Defenseman Dave Babich went to the Winnipeg Jets at number two, while Montreal junior standout Denny Savard was chosen by the Chicago Blackhawks with the third overall pick. In future years, the Canadians were often criticized for passing on local legend Savard to take Wickenheiser. But that's a textbook example of hindsight is 2020. There wasn't a scout or a team in the league that didn't have Wickenheiser tabbed as a can't miss future superstar. In fact, of the 21 GMs polled right after the draft, 15 said they'd have picked Wickenheiser number one, while the remaining six would have taken Babich. But there was one hockey person who did actively lobby to take Savard number one, new Montreal coach Claude Ruel. But he was overruled by both Grunman and Caron, who insisted on Wickenheiser. Montreal's decision to bypass Savard for Wickenheiser was widely accepted with only smatterings of protests from the French media. Soon, however, these small smatterings of dissent would soon mushroom into something far more sinister. It didn't take long for Doug Wickenheiser's dream to turn into a nightmare. Starting in training camp, Ruel, perhaps still agitated over the loss of Savard, went out of his way to take out his frustrations on Wickenheiser. Claude Lorel did not like him, Larry Robinson recalled years later. Ruel didn't think he was a quality NHL player, 
or a decent number one pick. Now, as fate would have it, the Canadians opened their season against Savard and the Blackhawks at the Forum in front of a national audience on Hockey Night in Canada. While Wickenheiser pedaled away on an exercise bike in the Habs locker room as a healthy scratch, Savard dazzled the crowd and was the game's first star in a 5-4 Chicago win. De La Rouche, maintenant Savard, et enfin Schott et Robinson qui suivent. Denis Savard, belle accélération, quel beau jeu. Le voici qui s'avance un peu plus loin et le but Très beau but. Denis Savard, absolument superbe. Le jeu est clé, un territoire meute, force d'accélération qui l'est. Wickenheiser's season went downhill from there as he recorded just 15 points in 40 games, while Savard posted 28 goals and 75 points. Although he worked hard and handled his play with class, Wickenheiser's NHL debut was a total bust. The 1981-82 season promised to be different for Doug as Ruel was replaced as Canadian's head coach by Bob Berry. However, Berry moved Doug away from his natural center position to left wing, a position he had never played before. Doug fell out of favor with Berry and completely lost his confidence, recording just 35 points in 56 games. Meanwhile, Savard emerged as a full-fledged NHL superstar, finishing sixth in league, scoring with 119 points. But the 1982-83 season would provide a glimmer of hope for Wickenheiser. He was among the NHL scoring leaders early in the season and ended up with a career-best 25 goals and 55 points, often playing in a line with Ryan Walter and Guy Lafleur. Despite his improved play, it was clear that Wickenheiser would never compare favorably with Savard, and as a result, he faced the venom of Montreal fans. Making matters worse was the Habs' four straight first-round playoff exits. So to no one's surprise, in the summer of 1983, we saw the firings of both Irving Grunman and Ron Caron. Now with his two foremost champions in the front office now gone, Doug Wickenheiser found himself as a player adrift, and his days in Montreal were numbered. But Caron was named GM of the St. Louis Blues, and on December 21, 1983, he acquired Wickenheiser, Greg Pazlowski, and Gilbert Delorme for Perry Turnbull. Such ended one of the most controversial and disappointing careers of Montreal Canadiens history. Doug Wickenheiser was all of 22 years old. Speaking of Wickenheiser's Montreal tenure, his ex-junior coach Brian Murray said, quote, they ruined him. Here was a kid from a small town who was always the best at whatever he did. He was a natural athlete, the best ball player, the best hockey player by far, and suddenly he's not even good enough to play. They sit him in the stands. They ruined his confidence. He got all mixed up, depressed, started drinking. He didn't know how to handle it at such a young age, and it never should have happened. He was more than good enough to play right away. He was a superb hockey player, and he should never have sat one game in the stands. In St. Louis, Wickenheiser finally began to enjoy the game again, settling into defensive role and contributing 28 points in 46 games. In 1984-85, Wickenheiser took major strides in reaching his projected potential. Centering a checking line with Mark Reeds and Jorgen Pedersen, Doug scored 23 goals in the Blues' first 68 games. In that 68th game, March 10, 1985, Doug scored three goals and a win over the Detroit Red Wings. On practice on March 14th of 1985, Blues coach Jacques Demer rewarded Doug's hard work by placing him on the Blues' first line with future Hall of Famers Bernie Federko and Joey Mullen. Demers noted that Doug had one of the best shots in the league and should easily be a 30-goal scorer. It seemed that Doug Wickenheiser had finally arrived. And then the dark cloud that had been following Doug since he joined the NHL appeared once again. And this time, it was the worst hit yet. After that uplifting practice on March 14, the Blues players took part in a rookie initiation ceremony, but Doug slipped climbing out of the back of a pickup truck, fell backwards into the road, and was struck by an oncoming car, blowing out his MCL and his ACL. After undergoing four and a half hours of surgery, Doug was told by doctors that his hockey career may be over. In fact, the team doctor said his knee looked like a, quote, bomb site. But Wickenheiser remained upbeat and logged countless hours of painful rehabilitation over the next 12 months, and he returned to play midway through the 1985-86 season. He never regained full motion in his knee, but 
again settled into the role of face-off a defensive specialist to help a Blues team on the rise. Now, after finishing third in the Norris Division, the Blues upset the Minnesota North Stars in round one of the 86 playoffs before defeating the Toronto Maple Leafs in a hard-fought seven-game series in the Norris Finals. Matched up against the upstart Calgary Flames in the Campbell Conference Finals, the Blues found themselves on the verge of elimination in Game 6, down three games to two and facing a three-goal deficit in the third period. The Blues mounted a furious comeback to force overtime. And at the 7.30 mark of the first overtime period, Fortune finally smiled on Doug Wickenheiser, who scored the most famous goal in St. Louis history to that point, capping off the Monday night miracle. Sets it up for Ramage. Ramage into center ice to Federko. Federko stole it from Reinhardt. Breaking in to Hunter. Hunter shooting. Rebound. Wickenheiser scores! Wickenheiser! The winner for St. Louis and for the seventh game Wednesday in Calgary. And while the Flames went on to win the series two nights later, it couldn't dampen Doug's shiny moment and the greatest of all blues moments of the 1980s. The Monday Night Miracle was undoubtedly the high point of Doug's career. The next year saw Doug grind his way through an eight-goal season. Never a fast skater, Doug's knee injury had slowed him considerably. His longtime champion, Ron Caron, left him exposed in the 1987 NHL waiver draft and was not particularly charitable to him as he sent him packing, even suggesting that Doug consider another vocation. The Vancouver Canucks claimed Doug in a 1987 NHL waiver draft and he labored as the Canucks fourth line center before setting off on a nomadic hockey journey that saw stops on the Canadian Olympic team, a single game with the New York Rangers, and 43 games with the Washington Capitals before ending his NHL career in 1990. Doug Wickenheiser's NHL career, which had begun with so much hype, now ended with a whimper. He had spent a year playing in Italy in 1990-91, followed by a year in Austria, before winding up his professional career with stops in the International Hockey League in remote outposts like Peoria in Fort Wayne. Now, while in Peoria, Doug noticed a small growth on his wrist, but team doctors dismissed it as a cyst. A year later, Fort Wayne doctors also told him it was a cyst, but they encouraged him to have it surgically removed. With his playing career over, Doug moved to his true home, the city of St. Louis, and he opened the Blue Line Nursery along with Wick's frozen custard and settled into a domestic life. Doug was married on August 8, 1992 to a local girl, Diane Peppel. On August 4, 1994, Doug became proud father to twin baby girls. Life was good for Doug Wickenheiser until cruel fate entered his life once again. Four days after his twins were born, Doug underwent surgery to finally remove that cyst from his wrist, while again being reassured by doctors that it was nothing to be concerned about. But three days later, in just a week after the birth of his twins, Doug learned that the cyst was cancerous. He was diagnosed with bone cancer and was given the option of amputating his arm or enduring chemotherapy. He chose the latter option and immediately began grueling radiation treatments. Meanwhile, Doug threw himself into the St. Louis community, his business, and especially his new family. 1997 saw Doug and Diane welcome their third daughter into the world. But everyone's worst fears were soon realized when in October that same year, Doug's cancer returned in the form of a lemon-sized tumor on his right lung. It was then that Doug and his family were told the news that no one ever wants to hear. The tumor in his lung was cancerous and inoperable. Facing the biggest battle of his life, Doug dedicated himself to fighting this dreaded disease. Inspiring all those around him, Doug fought cancer with a level of courage that most can only aspire to. And in his honor, the St. Louis Blues began wearing a special helmet decal bearing the wick of a candle and the number 14. On March 14, 1998, the Blues held Doug Wickenheiser Night. Following a Blues League game that afternoon, 36 ex-teammates and friends, including Haley Wickenheiser, Doug's fourth cousin, participated in an old-timers alumni game, followed by a dinner and auction which raised $100,000 for the newly formed 
14 fund. Four months later in July, doctors found cancerous lesions in Doug's brain. Doug fought his battle sustained by faith, hoping that prayer would provide the miracle of miracles. But there'd be no more miracles for Doug Wickenheiser. On January 12, 1999, Doug lost his valiant and courageous battle with cancer. He was 37 years old and he left behind wife Diane and three daughters. That same year, the Blues raised a banner with number 14 and the Wick logo to the rafters and announced that the 14 Fund would be the team's official charity. While he never became a superstar in the NHL, today the legacy of Doug Wickenheiser lives on in a lot of places. On the banner that bears his number, that is displayed in the Enterprise Center. In the 14 Fund that has raised millions for cancer research. In the Wickenheiser Cup, the name of the Missouri State Hockey Championship for small high schools. In the Wickenheiser Arena in Regina, Saskatchewan, and in the Brandt Arena in Regina, where his number 12 hangs from the rafters. And Doug's spirit is especially alive today in the eyes of the family he left behind but still inspires to this day. The Pro Hockey Alumni is dedicated to promoting and celebrating the legends who made the game great. Here are two more videos created for those who love the history of the game.